Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 139. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra snippets of travel, history, and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And firstly, Madeline and I want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a happy holiday season wherever you are around the world and however you celebrate. We're releasing this episode right before Christmas, so it has a particularly strong Christmas atmosphere. As the title says, we're including snowflake angels and gingerbread, and we have a lovely feature interview with a small family-run spinning mill in Switzerland. Actually, we've got two feature interviews, and both are with small family-run businesses. So the Swiss spinning mill Vetch goes back four generations in their family, and the Bavarian gingerbread bakery Hutzel who we're featuring in our maker segment, goes back three generations. And I just want to say something very quick about small family-run businesses. I think they're so important because they can really contribute to their local economies and help to create a sense of identity and belonging within their local communities. And one reason is because their survival depends on delivering top quality products and giving extra personal service and both our featured businesses do exactly this. Just excuse my block nose, I've had a cold so sorry about that. I'm <laughs> sounding a little bit nasally. So the Swiss spinning mill Vetch is in a tiny village in the Swiss mountains. All their employees live in the same village and they're producing top quality Swiss hand knitting yarns using Swiss wool, cotton and silk. And similarly, the gingerbread bakery Hutzel which is located in a small Bavarian village, employs only locals to make the highest quality handmade gingerbread or Liebkuchen as it's called here in Germany. So Madeline did this interview with Herr Hutzel from the bakery and we filmed the entire handmade process showing you all the wonderful ingredients that go into their delicious gingerbread. So if you are a baking enthusiast, I think this is a really special treat for you. Yeah, and the gingerbread is so yummy. Mum has completed her Christmas snowflake angel and we have a short film showing you how it's put together. Then I've been working on some Anna and Carlos Christmas balls, which I'm keen to show you. We'll give you updates on our finished projects in Bring and Brag and our ongoing projects in Under Construction. So grab a mug of Glühwein if you're here with us in Germany or mulled wine if you're anywhere else. And let's start with Mum and her glittery snowflake angel. Yes, here she is, my (laughs) beautiful Christmas snowflake angel. And I'm really thrilled with how she's turned out. She's really cool. (laughs) She is very pretty. So as I said previously, Madeline and I are going to spend Christmas this year with a family in North Germany. So I'm making this angel, I made this angel as a gift for them. And the design is by the UK toy designer, Alan Dart, who we featured in episode 118. So here's a picture of the original design. She stands at around 38 centimetres tall without her halo. And you can see I've made some minimal changes. Alan wrote this pattern over 20 years ago for a UK magazine and the recommended Sirdar yarn used on her skirt and her wings has since been discontinued but whenever this happens Alan always makes suggestions for other yarns that you can substitute. So if you can just hold this a minute. So while I was looking around for substitute yarns I came across this crazy glitter yarn called Creative Bubble by Rico Design. And it really glitters like sunlight shining on snowflakes. So I thought it's absolutely perfect to make her skirt out of, to use on her skirt and also on the edging that goes around her bodice, around the neck and on the cuffs. And I think the the effect looks really fantastic. So I'm very happy with it. But this yarn was pretty difficult to work with. It's elastic, which means that when you've got the skirt, and you're trying to stuff it firmly, it just keeps growing and growing and stretching. And Alan, the designer, wants you to stuff the skirt and and the whole um, body actually very firmly so that the angel stands tall and solidly. And she does have a circle of cardboard in the base of her skirt, so that means that she's going to stand upright, but she still needs to be firm all over. So initially I tried to stuff the skirt really firmly and it just kind of grew into this round snowball, which wasn't the elegant effect that I wanted for my angel. (laughs) (laughs) So I had to use a whole lot less stuffing in um, in the skirt. 
I used the recommended yarn on the bodice and the arms and that's been stuffed firmly so she's working perfectly in the top part of her body but I couldn't get rid of this kind of little weak wobble at the top part of her skirt around her waist. So that was a bit of a drama for me. So in the end, I decided to give up two of my wooden DPNs to take the wobble out of her waist and keep her erect. So originally I had five of these 2.75 wooden uh, DPNs and now my angel has one on either side of her body to keep her erect. And so, they're knit pro, aren't they? Uh, I, yeah, they're quite expensive. You sacrificed your expensive <laughs> needles. I know. but And this isn't the first time either. That's true. I have used a needle before to keep things erect. Okay, so what I did, you can't stick it right up from the bottom because there's cardboard there, but I, I put it, I like threaded it in through the base of her skirt, up through her skirt and into her bodice. So my angel now has <laughs> one of these on each side of her body inside but if I hadn't told you you really wouldn't know because you can't see it and you can't feel it but it's doing the job perfectly so <laughs> I'm thrilled if in doubt just use one of your tools <laughs> okay so another thing I want to point out are her wings yeah so this yarn is totally perfect for creating the feathery look of, of wings it's the uh, Schach and Meyer Baby Smiles Lenya Soft Maxi and I really like the way the wings have turned out. So you knit them flat and then you fold them in half and you seam around the edges here. And then you backstitch two long seams going up through the center of the wings. And then when, when they've been stuffed, it creates three separate sections that just look like these long wing feathers down the bottom, down the base. So I really like that. Um, I love all these details that he incorporates and Alan always gives his characters interesting poses and I think my angel is looking very classical and elegant the way she's standing here with a little dove resting in the palm of her hands ready to take off in flight. You can see the outstretched shape of its wings and tail feathers. Actually you may not be able to see it because it is white and we've got bright lights on but from here you can see all the details very clearly and it looks lovely. Also, I think her hair is very pretty. She's got quite a medieval hairstyle going on here. Uh, the yarn that's used is three ply and it untwists into three separate curly strands that are much thinner. And you have to do that, of course, by hand. So I just sat in front of a, a movie. It took me at least 40 minutes just untwisting. <laughs> it's worth it though. It's totally worth it. The effect looks lovely and it's very pretty. It make me a little bit jealous. I wish I had curls like that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am really thrilled with the, how she turned out. Knitting all the pieces, individual pieces, is very easy and I like that. It's very interesting to see how a toy like this is constructed and put together. But I think the best bit is just having this very cute character to look at in the end. And whenever I knit uh, Alan Tart or finish an Alan Dart design, I immediately feel like knitting another one. I've turned into a bit of an addict. Yeah. <laughs> so I have gone out and bought another pattern, which I just quickly want to show you. So here it is. It's Romeo and Juliet. And when I saw them, I thought they're so cute and I just had to laugh. So Juliet stands at around 35 centimetres or 14 inches tall. And you could just imagine how cute they'd look on your sitting on your mantelpiece. And I had the idea that this would make a really great Valentine's gift. And Valentine's is on February the 14th, which isn't too far away. So if you wanted to, you could knit along with me to create a sweet gift for your Valentine. And even if you don't have a Valentine, I think this lovely couple would still look adorable sitting on your mantelpiece. So getting back to my snowflake angel, as I said, all the knitting is very, very beginner knitting. It's very easy. It's just stocking stitch with some increases and decreases. But if you're a little bit nervous about how you put or construct a toy like this, you can watch me do it in the upcoming video and I hope it boosts your confidence. So enjoy the video and we'll see you very soon with some more. Oh. 
I've knitted all the individual flat pieces of the angel and sewn them together as much as possible before I assemble her. The skirt is made from a glittery elastic yarn and after I've sewn in the base of the skirt I spread glue over one side of a cardboard circle and fit it inside the base of the skirt. The fabric of my skirt is really elastic so I want to make sure the seam fits equally around the edge of the cardboard circle and the glue needs to set so I'm using this rather heavy glass to put some weight on the cardboard just to ensure that the fabric doesn't move while the glue is setting. Next I finish sewing up the seam on the skirt with mattress stitch and then I stuff the skirt. The pattern says to stuff firmly but the material of my skirt is so elastic that if I stuff it too firmly it's going to turn into the shape of a snowball so I have to be careful. The next step is to sew the bodice seam up the centre back and across the shoulders, stuff it firmly which I've already done and then join the waist edges of the skirt and the bodice together. This next step is really cool. You sew up the shoulders and you leave a little hole so that you can stick a straw in the centre to support the neck. So I've placed some glue on the end and I push the straw into the hole leaving about 4 centimetres in length at the top of the bodice. And I spread glue on the upper part of the straw and closely bind this section with flesh coloured yarn. And you have to repeat this a few times to make it really thick and firm. I didn't do mine that neatly but it still turned out okay. The neck piece goes on over the top and you line up the seam on the neck at the centre back so it will be covered by the hair. Now I made a mistake here, I should have pulled the lower edge of the neck out deeper so it sits lower and almost touches the, the shoulder point on each side. So if you make the angel you'll know how to do this but I compensated later by adding extra thickness to her collar. After you sew down the neck it's time to put the head on. The head has a mattress stitch seam up the centre back and is firmly stuffed. And then with some glue it sits over the neck and after I've pinned it in place I sew the base of the neck to the base of the head and again I do that with mattress stitch. And next comes the arms which are shaped to bend at the elbows and then stuffed. And this part was tricky because I had to find a natural arm position. So it's really worth taking the time to pin them in place and look from all angles to see that they're sitting right and naturally before sewing them on. The hands are overlapped and held that way with a few stitches because the little dove is going to be sitting in her hands later. So next comes the collar and cuffs of her bodice. They get wrapped around and sewn on and if you've been a little bit messy or like me you didn't stretch out the neck wide enough you can hide all of these sins under the collar and cuff by just making the collar and cuffs a little bit bigger. The wings go on next. So they've been sewn together and stuffed and now I have to place them evenly on her back and Alan gives very clear instructions they must be sewn four stitches apart at the centre of her back. So she's really starting to look like an angel now. I was most nervous about embroidering the face because just having the features a couple of millimetres apart can totally change the expression. So it's best to first mark the eye positions with a pin and again Alan gives clear instructions and he uses the knitted fabric like a grid. So the eyes are placed an exact number of rows down and an exact number of stitches apart. The eyes are embroidered with a lazy daisy stitch with a small straight stitch inside each chain to make them more circular. And the ends of the yarn are taken through to the back of the head and tied in knots. And after that she gets some eyebrows, a little button nose and a sweet little smile. And I spent quite some time poking around trying to shape her features until they looked just right. I was also really nervous about sewing on her ears because if I got them wrong she could look really silly. 
The hair is really interesting the way it's created and I really enjoyed this part. You do a row of chain stitches starting at the center front of her head and then across the back of her head from the top of one ear to the top of the other ear. And you cut about 40 pieces of hair colored yarn and each piece is about 25 centimeters long. And you thread your needle with three pieces of this yarn, so it has to be a pretty big needle, and then sew through the first chain on one side of the head, then through the chain on the top of her head, and finally through the chain on the opposite side of her head. And you just keep repeating that until all the chains are filled with hair. The pattern says to trim her hair to shoulder length, but as you can probably guess, I really like long hair, so that's what my angel is having. And the next part was particularly painful because you have to take each piece of yarn in turn and twist the end anti-clockwise between your fingers to separate the yarn into three individual strands. And then using a blunt needle, you tease out each strand separately to create the curly hair. But really is worth it because her hair looks fantastic that way. And finally, I need to make her halo, which I do by gluing the ends of a gold cord together to form a circle. And then I sew it to the back of her head with some transparent thread. She needs a little bit of blush on her cheeks to make her extra pretty, and then she's finished. And right at the end, I sew the little dove in the cup of her hands and I spray her face and arms and the little dove with hairspray. And I do this to better shape her arms as well as the little wings of the dove and also to keep her face protected from dust. So I've also been working on some Christmas decorations. Every year, Anna and Carlos design a set of Christmas balls that you can hang off your Christmas tree. Now we have a lot of leftover yarns in our stash and this is the perfect project to use up some of it. Now you can find their designs on the website, but I particularly like the Christmas balls from 2020 because they have a lot of very cute images on them. And here are some of my favorites. This one is called Old Fashioned and shows a row of Christmas crackers. We spent Christmas in Ireland when I was little and I fondly remember convincing my dad to buy Christmas crackers every single year. Another one of my favorites is the ice skating Christmas ball which shows an old fashioned pair of skates and I did figure skating for a little while so I just had to knit one of these. There's also one with a moose on it which I think is really cute and naturally I also had to make one with the gingerbread men as gingerbread is a major theme in this episode. So for most of these Christmas balls you just repeat the same motive four times. But for the Winter Wonderland Christmas ball you actually have a different picture on each quarter. It's really gorgeous. It shows a little village with a church, two huts, a big Christmas tree, and what I think is probably the star of Bethlehem. So Anna and Carlos recommend using DK weight yarn on 3.5 millimeter needles. I did this for the first two Christmas balls, um, but I wasn't quite happy with the fabric that it produced because I thought it was a bit too loose. And that's why I went down to 3.25 millimeter needles for my last Christmas ball, which is the gingerbread one. And I think the fabric looks a lot better. 
Another thing that, or mistake that I did in the first two was that I wove in my floats every two to three stitches, which is just too often. And what can happen is that the floats peek through to the front side of the fabric. And this doesn't look very nice, especially if you've got a strong contrast color. Yeah. So for my gingerbread ball, I think I wove it in every four to seven stitches. And that did produce a better result. Yes. Otherwise it disturbs the pictures because they're such clear images. Yeah. Aren't they? yeah. I actually think if I knitted another Christmas, Christmas ball, then I'd go down to three millimeter needles because I do believe that a tight fabric just looks better when you're making these little images. And since you don't have to wear the fabric that you're producing, it doesn't matter whether the ball's smaller or larger. And it also helps to prevent the stuffing from showing. Yeah. Although yeah. I don't ha really have that problem. No, you don't. Um, yeah, the good thing is that when you buy one of these patterns is you have 24 opportunities to get better. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you'll be an expert by the end of it. Totally. Um, now, for the colour work, I used the two-handed fail technique, which I also used recently for my colour work socks by the Coffee Socks by Charlotte Stone. I really like that method. Um, and... I know the traditional colors for these things tend to be red, white, and green, so I just went for those colors as well. For the ice skating ball, I used white for the background to represent the ice, and then green for the skates. They are gorgeous old-fashioned skates. They are, yes. And I am tempted to make another pair in tighter needles, because yeah. they're really cool. Yeah. Like I said, I did figure skating, so they spoke to me. <laughs> then for my gingerbread ball... Uh, I used this yellow mustardy color for the gingerbread men and then for the background the dark red red wine and mum pointed out that it looks like mulled wine. With yes Liebkuchen. it reminds me of Liebkuchen and mulled wine. Yeah, which is a <laughs> lovely idea. Um, yeah so the buttons and the eyes and mouth are also in the red wine color which I really like. I think the effect of having a light color against a dark background actually looks really good in these Christmas balls. So once you've... oh no there's one more. Um, lastly I knitted the Winter Wonderland Christmas ball, and for that, again, I used the white and the, uh, the green. The white, obviously, I chose for the motive color because of the snow. I haven't seen a green sky before, <laughs> but my excuse is that I didn't have any blue yarn in my stash, and this is a wonderland, so I think nature's allowed to break some rules. It's sort of a bluey green. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's pretty all the same. And once you've knitted the Christmas ball... You pull together the yarn on the top and bottom, and of course you fill the ball with stuffing. For that, I used the sheep's wool, just yeah. plain fleece. Yeah. Um, you sort of you're told to pull it apart a little bit so it goes nice and lofty. You also found that you stuffed the last one the best, didn't you? Yes. So you, you get sort better of with practice. Developed a technique, yeah. Um, and then for the hanging loop, you crochet it using chain stitch, which. This was like the second time that I did it, but it went super fast, so I was very happy about that. And then you sew it into the top. So these are my little Christmas balls, which I'll probably take with me. To Christmas, yeah, yeah, on the Christmas tree. Yes. And uh, because this is a special Christmas episode, we do want to share with you a German Christmas tradition of eating gingerbread. We'll be eating it in front of you and you can be jealous as we eat it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we uh, did an interview with the uh, Liebkuchen Bakery Hatsu, which is coming up soon. And gingerbread actually has a long history in Germany. It dates back to the 13th century. The German word for gingerbread is Lebkuchen. So Kuchen means cake, and Leb is thought to derive from Leib, which translates to a loaf of bread, although people don't really use the word Leib anymore in German. There are two main categories of Lebkuchen. You've got Oblaten Lebkuchen and Brown Lebkuchen. Oblaten Lebkuchen are generally round, and the dough contains a lot more nuts, and then it's pressed onto a wafer, which is basically like edible paper. You'll see this in our interview with the Lebkuchen Bakery Hatze. Now, brown Lebkuchen contain much more flour and they aren't pressed onto wafers because the dough is a lot more stable. So in the upcoming interview, I talked to Michael Hatze, who runs the Gingerbread Bakery Hatze, together with his brother, Christian. The bakery is in a town called Zeb, which is in the Fichtel Mountains near the German-Czech border. So we drove through some really beautiful scenery to get yeah. there. It all started with their grandfather, actually, who opened the bakery in 1928, and he had learned to make gingerbread in the city of Nuremberg. Nuremberg has a long history of making gingerbread, partly because in the high and late Middle Ages, it was a center for long-distance trade. So the bakers 
had access to all manner of spices from foreign countries. Today, the name Nürnberger Lebkuchen is actually legally protected. So it doesn't matter what type of Lebkuchen you make, as long as you produce it within the city of Nürnberg, you're allowed to call it Nürnberger Lebkuchen. The gingerbread bakery Hatze specializes in Elisenlebkuchen, which are considered to be one of the highest forms of Lebkuchen, and they originated in Nürnberg. Elisenlebkuchen has a very high percentage of nuts and almonds, along with a very small amount of flour in comparison. And so in the upcoming interview, you'll actually see how Mr. Hatze pours egg white into the mixture to help bind all the ingredients together, and they then use an old machine from his grandfather to press the dough onto the wafers, and the wafers are how you can tell that it's an oblaten Lebkuchen. An example of brown Lebkuchen are the Aachener Printen, produced in the German town of Aachen, which lies in the border to Belgium. Unlike Nürnberger Lebkuchen, the Aachener Printen not only have to be made in Aachen, but they must also follow a particular recipe. So Aachener Printen was developed in the early 1800s while Napoleon was in power. Napoleon had strife with the British Empire, and in 1806 he decreed a continental blockade, preventing the British Empire from trading with Europe. So Germany needed a new source of sugar, and started extracting sweet syrup from the sugar beet. And the sweet syrup was a lot more tough and changed the consistency of gingerbread dough. Now, the name Printen is thought to come from the English word to print. And early on, gingerbread makers would pour the dough into these wooden casts that had different shapes or even caricatures carved into them. Now, this cast is from the early 19th century and illustrates a Napoleonic officer. So it was thought to be a fun gag to make gingerbread that looked like Napoleonic soldiers or whoever else might have been your enemy at the time, and then people could bite off their heads. <laughs> unlike, great. Yeah, unlike Elisenlebkuchen, though, Aachener Printen contain a lot of flour and they're not baked onto wafers because they're very stable by themselves. So gingerbread will last for about three to four months, maybe a bit less if you make it yourself. And if you store it together with apples, the apples will give off moisture and help to keep the gingerbread nice and juicy. So if you ever make gingerbread, you might want to try that out. And after the interview, Herr Hatzel gave us this lovely tin of a Liebkuchen, and which we'll open up. And the photos are old photos of the grandfather and his staff during the early days of the bakery. So it's a really lovely tin. Yeah. It comes in light chocolate. <laughs> Thank you. And glazed almond. By the way, this is the wafer on the back. Yeah. And also dark chocolate, but dark chocolate is our favorite, so they go very quickly. Yeah. So have a little taste. Mmm. <laughs> One more interesting fact that I don't think they mention in the interview is that these gingerbread, they go onto wooden pallets when they go into the oven, and that's specifically so that these wafers don't get burnt and they stay nice and white. That's true. Yeah. So you can buy this Lebkuchen online, and they do ship worldwide, but depending on where you're living around the world, the shipping cost could be a little bit high. So maybe it's only worth it if you're living in Europe. Now, during the upcoming interview, you'll hear the Dresden Children's Choir singing German Christmas carols, and the lyrics just go so perfectly with what we're filming, so we've translated them for you. They're down the bottom of the screen, so you can follow along. Okay, enjoy the video, and we'll enjoy our Lebkuchen. <laughs> Durch nur der alte, durch nur der alte, durch nur der 
Here in Germany, many people are heading to their local Christmas market to enjoy some mulled wine and Lebkuchen, which is a special treat for the holiday season. Lebkuchen, which is the German word for gingerbread, is a vital part of German Christmas customs. And over the centuries, different regions have developed their own unique recipes. So today there are various types of Lebkuchen, and some are even officially recognized with a protected geographical indication, like Nürnberger Lebkuchen. So Andrea and I have traveled to the Fichte Mountains in North Bavaria to visit the Lebkuchen bakery Hatzel. It's run by two brothers, Christian and Michael Hatzel, whose grandfather first opened the bakery in 1928. And they still produce their Lebkuchen by hand using their grandfather's original recipe. Michael, thank you so much for inviting us to your, your bakery. Oh, no problem. That's nice to see you here too, in Zell. Um, so... What exactly is Lebkuchen, and how has the process of making it perhaps changed throughout history? Lebkuchen is a very traditional Christmas pastry here in Bavaria. It's, a ver it's very nutritious, with very good ingredients, and a highly amount of spices in it. And um, it has a long shelf life as well, I believe? Yeah, it has a long shelf life because there is very little water in it, almost no water. And the, the sugar and the marzipan conserves, conserves the, the Lebkuchen so that they have a long shelf life. Yeah. And uh, what are the typical ingredients in Lebkuchen? Uh, the main ingredients are almonds and hazelnuts, then marzipan, then candied uh, oranges and candied lemons, uh, very little flour, a little bit of egg white, and the mixture of the spices. That's the main secret of the Lebkuchen. Yeah. I believe Lebkuchen was developed by monks during the Middle Ages in Germany? Yeah, it, uh, they were developed by monks during the Middle Ages. Uh, here in Bavaria, it's Nuremberg, because Nuremberg was uh, uh, a crossroad of the, gro of the big trade um, marks uh, in, in Bavaria, where also spices were traded. And um, I heard you say earlier that Lebkuchen was basically the power snack of the Middle Ages. Can you say more about that? Yeah, Lebkuchen are very, very nutritious. You can eat it as a small meal. There's everything in it you need for your life. Um, and uh, therefore, in the Middle Ages, they stored the Lebkuchen in their homes and ate it during uh, the winter season. And it's also an aphrodisiac. Oh. The reason that, they are, uh, that people buy Lebkuchen also. So that means it's not just good for Christmas, but also for Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, so what major categories of Lebkuchen are there today? Yeah, there are mainly three categories. Uh, braune Lebkuchen, so-called, I can't translate it, braune Lebkuchen, Obladen Lebkuchen and Elisen Lebkuchen. Which is what you produce, the Elisen Lebkuchen. Yeah, we produce Elisen Lebkuchen because it's the highest form of Lebkuchen with the most nuts in it and very, very few flour in it. Okay, so now we know a little bit more about what Lebkuchen is. Could you tell us the story behind your family business? Yeah, uh, my brother and I, we are now the third generation. My grandfather founded the, the bakery here in Zelp. Uh, he studied uh, Lebkuchen in Nuremberg, how to make them, and brought it here to Zelp and uh, started baking Lebkuchen in the late 1920s. Now we are more than... 90 years old, and still love to bake Lebkuchen. And your grandfather studied to become a master pastry chef in the end, and he used his uh, the, the recipe from Nuremberg to make it his own, though, didn't he? Yeah, they are all master pastry chefs. My grandfather, my father, my brother. So uh, it's, it's important because uh, you have to learn it as a master pastry chef to make Lebkuchen right. And what are you in charge of? Pardon me? What, what are you in charge of in the business? <laughs> um, my, my, my part is the administration and the sale of the Lebkuchen, the marketing of the Lebkuchen. I travel around to my customers in Germany, Switzerland and Austria uh, to visit them and convince them that we have the best Lebkuchen. I have one more question about the Lebkuchen that you specialize in. It's called Elisen Lebkuchen. Who's that named after? Uh, it's named after the Holy Elisa, Saint Elizabeth, the Holy Elizabeth, um, who was the saint of the bakers in the Middle Ages. So now that we know more about your family business, um, I'm just wondering, you grew up in the business, both you and your brother, you were always surrounded by Lebkuchen. Every day you see it, you smell it, and you've probably been eating it since you were a baby. So do you still enjoy eating Lebkuchen? 
I still enjoy them. I eat nearly every day one Lebkuchen with a dark chocolate because it's not so sweet and a cup of coffee as a second breakfast. Yeah. And mainly it's the recipe I love. This is a recipe book of my grandpa. We still have it and keep it um, with this original recipe. Maybe we can open it up. We can open it for sure. Here's the Lebkuchen. Please film not so... This is a secret recipe. Now, here's the, Lebkuchen, the original Lebkuchen recipe. And what's also important, this is the tin where my grandfather stored the spices, the mixture of spices of the Lebkuchen. Please smell a little bit. Wow, that's very in it's very intense. Yeah, for sure. This is um, our secret Lebkuchen. Spices mixture and I show you my grandpa. This is my grandpa over there. Here is his, his master pastry class in Stuttgart, where he also learned uh, being a pastry. And here, this little guy is my father. And now you produce a tin out of the, these images. <laughs> I have a tin. This is our historical tin with all the pictures of our family, all the historical pictures, and it's filled. That's very sweet. It's filled with six Lebkuchens with the different coatings, dark chocolate, milk chocolate, and sugar glaze with the almonds on it. And those are the three different types that you produce yeah. here. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the bakery now and you can show us the step-by-step -step process of how you make the Lebkuchen. Yeah, for sure. I would love to show you the Lebkuchen. Hier kommen die Zutaten in den, in den Mixer, das ist in Haselnüsse zum Beispiel, und werden vermixt zu einer Masse, die seht ihr da unten. Hier ist die fertige Masse, die dann in die Streichmaschine kommt. Hier sind Mandeln, Haselnüsse, Marzipan, kandierte Orangen, kandierte Zitronen, ganz wenig Mehl, äh, Eiweiß und äh, die Gewürze. Also das hier ist das Wichtigste bei unserer Lebkuchenherstellung. Das ist die uralte Handstreichmaschine unseres Opas. Die hat vor über 90 Jahren schon damit gearbeitet und sie funktioniert relativ robust und einfach. Hier oben kommt die Lebkuchenmasse rein und hier unten ist ein ausgeschnittenes Kugelsegment, wo die Oblaten eingelegt werden, einmal durchgedrückt und oben kommt dann die Masse auf den Lebkuchen. Okay, also sie kommen auf diese Bretter und werden dann in den Dreh geschoben, also in den Rechen geschoben. Und wenn dieses Ganze voll ist, kommt der Rechen in den Trockenraum, kommt der Rechen in den Trockenraum, wo die Lebkuchen über äh, acht Stunden schlafen werden. Oh, es riecht gut, oh, es riecht fein. Diese Lebkuchen hier haben jetzt acht Stunden geschlafen und kommen jetzt zum Backen in den Ofen.
In diesem Ofen werden die Lebkuchen gebacken, ungefähr 500 Stück. Sie werden 19 Minuten gebacken bei 190 Grad. Also in diesen beiden Behältern ist die geschmolzene Zartbitterschokolade. Sie wird vorbereitet, um die Lebkuchen mit einem ganz zarten Zartbitterüberzug zu überziehen. So, hier sind wir beim letzten Schritt der Fertigung. Hier werden die gebackenen Lebkuchen äh, auf ein Band gelegt und mit Zartbitterschokolade ganz leicht überzogen. Also hier kommen die Lebkuchen aus dem Kühlkanal. Sie werden kontrolliert, ob sie gleichmäßig mit Schokolade überzogen sind und dann in die Körbe gepackt für den Versand in die Verpackung. Isn't that children's choir gorgeous? Now, before starting the podcast, Mum actually worked as a professional musician. So early on, she decided that she would always incorporate beautiful music into the show. But because most music is copyrighted, we do have to let YouTube run the occasional advertisement on our videos, because this lets us use the music for free. A common misconception is that we also earn money through ad revenues, but this is not the case. All ad revenues go to whoever owns the copyright of the music we use. Yeah. We can only do this show through the financial support from our viewers using a platform called Patreon. So our patrons make a small monthly contribution starting at five US dollars a month. And as long as enough of our viewers decide to do this, we can afford to keep producing Fruity Knitting. So we do ask you, if you enjoy the show and you watch it, please do become a patron. Now Christmas is also a time for gift giving and saying thank you. And on behalf of Andrea and I, but also everybody watching this podcast, we want to say a really great big thank you to all of our wonderful patrons for making this show possible and available to everybody. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so in the last episode, we interviewed the mother-daughter team behind the Danish company Knitting for Olive, and we filmed that interview in their shop. So we got to see all their gorgeous yarns, which come in over 80 colours. And we also tried on quite a few shop samples of their designs. And Madeline and I fell in love with exactly the same designs. <laughs> but we thought we're going to knit them anyway because you have to knit what you love. As simple as that. And we're going to do them in different colours. So we each came back from that trip with enough yarn to knit three jumpers each, which is really excessive. We normally don't go quite so wild. I actually only buy yarn for the very next project I'm, I'm working on, so it is rather <laughs> excessive. Yeah. But as Madeline showed you in the last episode, she's been working on her Barbro blouse, and she talked about that in a lot of detail. Just to remind you, this is what it looks like. It's a slim-fitting, elegant top knitted in a shell-like lace pattern using Knitting for Olive Merino, which is a fingering weight yarn. And I was wearing a shop sample of the Barbara blouse during the interview with Penilla and Carolina, and I totally fell in love with how it looked and felt when I was wearing it. So being inspired by Madeline, I decided to get started on my version of the Barbara blouse and see if I could finish it for Christmas because... I bought this very fancy glittery skirt which I'm excited to wear on Christmas Eve and I thought the Barbara blouse was just a perfect top that would match this skirt, particularly because the colour I used is blue tit and I think it goes very well. It does. So I'm very excited about my outfit here. Now Luckily for me, Madeline had already started working on the pattern and doing all of her gauge swatches. And because I taught Madeline how to knit, our gauges are pretty much identical. So that saved me a lot of time. So, <laughs> but 
But the design comes in lots of different sizes and I couldn't quite recall what size I was wearing for the shop sample during the interview, but I figured it must be the second size, which is size small, because the measurements for that size is what I would choose for my body. So I cast on and got started. And then when I had knitted uh, about this, this much here, I thought I'll just check my gauge to make sure I'm on track. And my gauge was just a tiny little bit tighter than the recommended gauge, but I thought maybe that would even work to my favour because the top is meant to have negative ease and it's meant to just fit snugly all over you. So I was had no problems with that. So I kept merrily knitting along. If you can help me, Madeline. Mm -hmm. You knit it hold, by holding it. You knit it in the round um, up to the armhole, so you can sort of see that there. And then you separate and knit the front and back separately. So I did that and I started knitting the front and I got the front right up to where you start the front neck shaping. And I'm thinking I'm making fantastic progress. I'm definitely going to have it finished by Christmas. And then I tried it on and I found I had a bit of a problem. So here it is. I'm wearing it over a tight fitting light colored top and you can see that the fit looks okay and I could get away with it, but it's not brilliant. It's a bit loose around the lower body and the waist and the shell pattern isn't seen clearly. I think the shell pattern just needs to be stretched out more. So let's go quickly back to me wearing the blouse during the interview. And here you can see that the top is fitting a lot more snugly on me and the shell pattern is stretched out more, which I just think looks so much better. And I think this top is fitting me like a glove. And this is exactly the look that I want to achieve. So because I'm so excited about this design and I have such a clear image of how I want it to look, I've made the very tough decision to start again and knit the smaller size, which is extra small. So unfortunately, I won't have it ready for Christmas, but that's okay. It's better to have a top that's fitting me perfect than, than one I'm only semi-pleased with. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this knitting. There's no mistakes in it. I've knitted almost half of the design. It's actually really lovely knitting, beautiful color. So instead of ripping it back, I'm going to put it to one side with the intention of coming back and finishing it at a later point and giving it away to someone as a gift who's just very slightly bigger than me. So that's my intention. We'll see how I go with that. <laughs> but I have started again, but this time with another color because I just cannot, just to cheer me up, because I cannot knit the same garment twice or the same design twice in the same color and then have Madeline knit it again. So I, I am. <laughs> I, I also decided to rip back and knit it in size XS because mum and I have the same measurements and like she said, same we have the tension. same gauge. Yeah. So yeah. it's good that I found that out first and yes. not you. So you can see how much of a quick knit it is because this is what I've done in my new colour. So it's curling up at the bottom now, but it, that'll go away when it's been blocked. So you can see that you knit it in the round to the armholes and then you separate. So there's the front. I've done the front. It's really pretty. Uh, it, it is. And I tried it on and it fits me perfectly and the lace is stretched out just how I want it. And the back has got this very lovely little teardrop opening that's going to be on the back with three little buttons and once you finish the front and the back separately you graft it on the shoulder seams so that's what I've done so far I'm very and that color it sort of looks like a fish tail it, it's sort of a fish like a color, mermaid yes. <laughs> yeah and scales and things I like it yeah Okay, so this is the Dusty Aqua, and Madeline says it's very close to her colour, which is Dusty Sea Green, right? It's fairly close. Yeah. They both have a sort of grey wash in them. That's right, a grey wash yours over is a the lot colour. Bluer. But see, that's what's so much fun about knitting, um, shopping at Knitting for Olive. They have every possible imaginable shade of green, so I'm really in heaven. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And now we're in bring and brag because I've actually finished my Gladden finally. I've been working on this for the past few months alongside my other projects and mostly it made for very easy television knitting. I had to concentrate a bit more for the front and back where I was working the lace, but the sleeves are plain stocking stitch. So that was really easy. Um, so this is actually my first jumper with oversized sleeves. I still like to call them puffed sleeves, but technically puffed sleeves are gathered along the shoulders and cuffs. But with the, uh, with the gladden, the sleeves aren't gathered. Instead, the armholes are just really low to make up for how wide the sleeve gets. 
Um, last time I talked about this jumper, I think I'd knitted most of the front and back pieces. So after that, I just worked the sleeves. And you start with the cuffs, which is a simple ribbing. And as you knit upwards, you increase every few rows by doing a yarn over, like with lace. So this creates little holes. I don't know if you can see them, which not only look pretty, but I found them really useful. Because as your sleeve gets quite long and you want to know where you're up to in the pattern or how many more increases you have to do, all you need to do is count the number of holes in your sleeve and you know exactly where you're up to. Instead of all the rows. <laughs> yeah, that was so cool. That's um, actually a signature um, design style of Kim Hargraves. I didn't know that. Yeah. You've knitted more Kim Hargraves yeah. designs than I have. Anyway, once you've worked all the increases, you continue knitting straight until you've reached the desired length. I didn't quite know how long these sleeves needed to be because I didn't know where this shoulder seam, how high up or low it was on my shoulder. Whether it's going to sit on the top or yeah, hang over. That yeah. changes how long your sleeve needs to be. So I put my sleeves on hold and then I sewed together the front and back pieces along the shoulder seams so that I could try the body on and see where this sat on my shoulder and then I measured how long my sleeves needed to be. That's and how you got a perfect fit. Yes, that's right. Then I sewed everything together and I was so excited about finishing this jumper because the fabric is really soft and beautiful and of course the design's very cute as well. But it's when I tried it boy on, knits yarn. Yeah, the yarn is Cabin Boy Knits and Mohair by Kana. Yeah. But I don't remember the colour. Um, but when I tried this jumper on, my heart just sank. I was so worried and disappointed because I thought the sleeves were just way too big compared to the body which at the time was really quite fitted and I was really disappointed because I just didn't know how to fix this without ripping back the sleeves and at least half of the front and back but because I'd sewn everything up mum said that I should just block it and see what happens yeah. and I did this and while I was waiting for my gladden to dry, I hopped on the internet to find out what other people have thought of really big sleeves throughout history. And what I found was really amusing, so I just want to share that with you. In early 16th century Venice, large sleeves were incredibly popular in women's fashion. In fact, women's sleeves were getting so large that the government put official restrictions on how much cloth, gold, silver, and silk were allowed to be used for one sleeve. And if a lady was caught wearing illegal sleeves, she had to pay a fine and hand over her sleeves to the officials. Of course, the tailor who made those sleeves could also expect to get in trouble. I thought that was really funny, and my sleeves are tiny in comparison, so I don't think I would be fined. There's one more thing I want to mention, which is these bobbles. I was a little bit worried that be, they'd be incredibly perky. I might look a bit like a disease. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I did is when I blocked the gladden, I piled a whole lot of really fat knitting books on top. It was and the principles that of knitting. press them down a bit. Yeah. Was yeah. on it. But you have to put a towel on in between so that the water doesn't get into the books. Yeah, I'd say even two towels just to make sure. But that worked really well. Yeah. So, so now the gladden is blocked, I think it looks much better. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's really gorgeous. And I'm thrilled that you're happy with it. Yeah. <laughs> that was looking to be a sad, sad story. But we're going to do a fashion shoot, film a fashion shoot with the gladden and also my Blue Lagoon Flowers Fest, which I've also finished and we'll show you that in the next episode. So next up is our interview, feature interview with Vol Spinnerei Vetch, which translates to the Vetch Woolen Spinning Mill. And Christoph Vetch is the fourth generation in his family to work the mill. So the textile industry used to be really important in Switzerland, but now most production has moved to countries with very low wages. So it's particularly tough to survive in Switzerland as a spinning mill. But they're specialising in very top quality Swiss hand knitting yarns and they've got a quite a wide range of yarns and interesting yarns ranging from on one hand a very rugged woolen spun yarn that is quite a rough yarn it's made from the local Swiss mountain sheep and that's suitable for hard wearing outerwear and hiking socks and then at the other end they're working in collaboration with two other old family spinning mills in Switzerland one spins silk and the other spins cotton the one that's spinning cotton is spinning the finest possible highest quality cotton there ever is it's like totally beautiful Top spinning notch. it yeah <laughs> spinning I think it they even won a competition yeah. yeah and it's used for very top-end Italian 
um, shirts. business shirts, like Armani business shirts. And so that in collaboration, they're producing luxurious blends of wool and cotton and wool and silk, each being a complete Swiss product. And Christoph is generously giving a 15% discount to Fruity Knitting patrons on everything in their online store. So this is including all their lovely yarns, but also roving for spinning and felting and kits and accessories. They have things like Chiagu needles, which are my personal favourites. So a very big thank you to Christoph for this very generous offer. So now it's time for us to say goodbye. Enjoy the interview with Vol Spinnerai Vetch and we'll see you very soon in January. Thanks for spending time with us. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm in a beautiful part of Switzerland in the heart of the Pretigel region and this is the home of the Wollspinnerei Fetch which is the fourth generation family run spinning mill and with me is the present owner of the mill Christoph Fetch. So Christoph it is really great to have you on Fruity Knitting and it's particularly great to be here in person because the mill is in such a beautiful location. So I thought for our worldwide viewers you could start by first describing where we are in Switzerland and saying what the landscape is like and then tell us about your meal and what kinds of things you're producing. Yeah, we'll be glad to do that. First of all, thank you for finding a way to us, to our small, tiny uh, mill. It was uh, a pleasure and a beautiful drive. <laughs> <laughs> As we go. Thank you very much. The Wolfspinnerei Fetch is located in a small, almost tiny village called Brockenotz. It's a little bit over an hour drive from uh, away from Zurich mm -hmm. and we are close to Davos or some of you might uh, know Klosters because uh, King Charles III went skiing here in the past, so it might be a little bit familiar to you. Um, we are a traditional family business in the fourth generation with roughly 135 years of uh, experience in spinning and uh, carding wool. So you know what you're doing? Kind of, I hope so, <laughs> so <laughs> that's fine. And uh, my great-grandparents started it with uh, working with the local farmers, they brought the wool, so we washed them and we carded them and sent it back to the, the farmers and they could use it for uh, hand spinning their own yarn for the garments uh, they needed for the daily business. Okay, yeah. yeah. And you. what about your parents? What did they do? Um, my parents changed that a little bit. They bought uh, a bigger carding machine mm -hmm. and uh, also a reactor ring spinning machine, which is still in use and uh, they used it uh, mainly for making wool for carpets, the main reason that we still use the Swiss wool. Okay, exactly. yes, because it's slightly coarser, isn't it? It's yeah. uh, much a little bit rougher, yes, than yeah. the regular one that's uh, used all over the world. And exactly. then when you and your wife took over the business, did it change again? It, uh, of course, every generation has to bring in some uh, new things. Uh, we got, uh, especially in the, in the last few years, we got a lot of requests from uh, farmers which uh, had alpaca animals. So they wanted to uh, uh, spin smaller amounts of wool. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to uh, invest money in a small spinning machine and also the hair so we could uh, properly run 
the alpaca fibers uh, for them as well, yes. Okay, and you've got quite an extensive dye house and I think you can do the whole process now from raw wool to the end balling, is that right? Exactly, in the dye house we uh, started washing the raw wool and uh, also with the dyeing and uh, the spinning and with the new balling machines we are able to uh, cover the whole variety of uh, products that are able to uh, that we are able to do right now. Yes. And who are the main customers? Well, basically, it's uh, people like you and me who really love wool and uh, like working with wool at all. And um, and uh, and uh, the, the dye house. We also have some uh, customers who are for uh, wholesale as a really big customer mm -hmm. for us, and especially the hand dyed yarn and our uh, yarn production we use for, uh, also we also sell to retailers within Switzerland as well, yes. And you've also done your own study on textiles and dyeing, haven't you? Yes, with uh, the lot of uh, fibres all over the world, it's uh, really important to get uh, good knowledge about the stuff. So uh, I made uh, an apprenticeship in a dye house, a yarn dye house especially, and uh, after that I studied for two years at the uh, Swiss Textile School and uh, increased my knowledge there a little bit and thought after that I'm gonna leave Switzerland to get a little bit more experience and uh, I made a training in uh, Los Angeles at a really big dye house for 18 months okay. so they run roughly 100,000 meters in 24 hours so it's quite a big difference to the tiny small full spinner I fetch we are uh, <laughs> working right now, yes, exactly. So what is the process then of working with a small business like an uh, alpaca or sheep farmer who wants you to make yarn from their fleeces? We got more and more requests from uh, alpaca farmers uh, especially to produce really, really small amounts of, of wool. Sometimes it's even wool from only from one animal, so it can be one or two kilos only. It's really hard for them to know what exactly they would they want to have with done with the wool because mm -hmm. usually they work with the animals and uh, they just want to do something with their wool. So it doesn't you, get burnt or yes, or exactly. They don't have to yeah. draw it away. Uh, so for them, it's important to to keep something uh, to do something with the wool because they have they have customers. They're gonna walk with the with the animal. They they uh, have a nice day spending there and uh, to keep a memory. They can buy one or two balls of yarn so they can knit uh, a hat or, okay. or they can from wear, that particular animal. From their particular animal, especially, yes, exactly. Yeah. That's sweet. <laughs> so, yes, that's that's really something what we do. So, the history behind uh, our products is really important for our customer as well. Yes, exactly. So, basically, they start shearing the wool and uh, they bring it to us and uh, yeah, basically we have to try and uh, see, uh, talk with the customer if we can make like a 50 gram ball of, of wool. It all depends a little bit of the quality of the wool they bring to us. That really, really depends because uh, they're not used uh, to know all the processes in the back end and they really thought, well, you can wash it and then everything is clean and it's nice. And that depends uh, really a bit uh, on uh, the quality we get. So sometimes you have to say no to them. Unfortunately, that's really frustrating for the clients and for us. If it's just too much dirt, too much grass and straw inside the wool, it's just not possible to, for us, to us uh, to make a good quality. Even if we have a lot of knowledge, even if we have the machines to do it mm. properly, uh, we still cannot cast miracles. Also, that's yeah. really something uh, we have to tell the customer and also to train them. So maybe in the next year they can... Uh, uh, get better wool. Get better yeah. wool, really sorted it out, and uh, at the, then we can uh, make a really nice yarn for them. So is this a typical uh, product that you'd produce for them? Yes, exactly. This one is uh, an Aron weight or a DK. It depends a little bit in, in two-ply usually. And uh, so most of their customer can uh, need really quick uh, something for their uh Special use, yes, exactly. So uh, we start the process by getting the wool when they start shearing it. And uh, we start washing the wool afterwards or the hair. It depends mm -hmm. a little bit, especially when we get uh, the alpaca fibers. We don't need caustic soda because it doesn't have that much grease on it like the, the Swiss wool, the raw wool we get uh, there. And uh, we also can reduce the temperature so the fiber does not... Uh, 
Oh. It's better, healthier for the fiber and also for, for, the for the environment. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. Even if the alpaca fiber doesn't have that much uh, guard hair. Guard hairs. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's an English <laughs> word I didn't know until now. Thank you. Um, we we still go over the hair uh, for the dehairing process because it takes out a lot of straw and grass and dirt, so we get a much much better quality of the yarn at the end. Okay, now. We've got some fleeces. Just um, talk a little bit about this. This is alpaca, is it, or is this just a... This one is a little bit special. It's a it's a very rare local Swiss brand. Okay. But the process basically is the same. Mm -hmm. So we take the, uh, the wool fibers and run it over the carding machine. So at the end we get the fleece like this. So we open the fibers uh, to a very, very thin fleece. And at the end we take this fleece together to uh, uh, roving or, or to a sliver so we can produce it uh, at the end on the chilling box. One thing is to, to make the fibers more parallel mm -hmm. so it's uh, better to run on the on the spinning machine and uh, it also gets more even so uh, when we when we pull it in the spinning machine we have a really even then, yeah. uh, yarn at the end. Okay. Yes, exactly. And um, I think this is you're going to say something about the difference between alpaca and wool fiber. Yes, exactly. Uh, first, when we uh, thought about uh, buying this uh, new machine, we thought, well, it's easier when we are using, we are used to run wool, and uh, the wool usually sticks very much together. It holds together because of all the, uh, the scales. The scales, exactly. Yeah. The scales, uh, all the structure the wool has, so it sticks together really nicely, and it's mm. easier to to uh, to run to to work with. So if you pull like this. The wool basically holds together and stays in in, uh, in one mm. place. And if you do the same thing with the with the alpaca uh, sliver, basically you pull it a little bit and then uh, it starts falling apart. <laughs> or, uh, there we go. <laughs> That's uh, a little bit uh, the problem we have with the alpaca fibers because they don't have this uh, these scales. So, so they're slippery. They're really really slippery. And uh, when you pull it a little bit on the on the chilling box, sometimes you you even pull it apart and then instead of getting it more even you that basically sounds... make it thicker or thinner at the end and that's uh, frustrating <laughs> gives us a little headache at the end yes of course no that's really a, well not a good thing at the end, of course yeah but okay. it's a really really important thing because on the afterwards on the spinning machine you pull that really really uh, um, have a really uh, a big tension. draft, yeah. A draft, yeah. And if you have it not really straightened out, it, it gets thickness and and uh, yeah. small tiny parts. Yeah. And that's really uh, at the end, it's not not a really uh, nice yarn. So uh, on the spinning machine, uh, basically we just pull it really really uh, a lot, like uh, fifty or sixty times uh, on the machine to get a really nice and uh, thin yarn, and. Uh, after after the spinning process, we start twisting it together again. Like I said, for a two ply mm -hmm. or a three ply, it depends a little bit what uh, the customer like better. And then it's right at the end, you actually wash it, don't you? Yes, exactly. We use some uh, auxiliaries for the spinning process and coating process. Like it's like a, a conditioner for the wool a little bit to uh, uh, keep the wool a little bit covered. It's it's not uh, that hard for the work. And uh, but we need to wash that out because at the end you want only the the wool and not all mm. the chemical mm -hmm. and all the oils uh, we need for the spinning process. So basically we make the skeins yeah. because we can uh, uh, use only skeins in the dye house. Yeah. And uh, with this washing process, uh, first like I said, we wash off the, yeah. the auxiliaries, and uh, also the yarn shrinks. In the lengths. Okay. So uh, we get. But therefore, it gets a bit fluffier. It gets a bit yeah. fluffier. So at the end, uh, in the beginning, it looks like a really, really thin uh, yarn, and then after washing it, really uh, after drying it, it goes, it, it shrinks together, and it really gets fluffy and and also a much, much more soft than uh, on on the spinning cone okay. as well. Yes. Okay, so say something quickly about this yarn here, which looks quite different. <laughs> yes, that's uh, a little, a little bit different. Uh, sometimes we have uh, uh, customer they don't like the yarn for knitting, but uh, for weaving carpets, and uh, basically it can be the same wool, but uh, uh, on this particular way we have it a little bit rougher. They are, uh, the animals are a little bit older, mm -hmm. and it's not that soft for for the skin. So we use this one uh, for the carpets. 
and uh, basically it's the same process uh, through the whole company but at the end we don't make the balls we leave it on the cone and uh, it's much much easier for uh, hand weaving, weaving yeah. to work uh, uh, out of the cones yeah um, maybe a little bit different this one here is a four ply yarn which has uh, roughly 400 meters per kilo as a not per 100 grams on the wow. per kilo so it's much much thicker yes uh, it's like a little also. rope <laughs> yes exactly oh, that's uh, a little bit <laughs> the difference in, <laughs> yeah. in the whole thing yes yeah. exactly okay so let's see a selection of your own yarns and then can you just talk about how you've designed them uh, first i would like to show you our fanin yarn it's um, uh, designed by my father or maybe even my grandfather it's uh, an iron weight three ply yarn and as you can see it has a lot of volume so it's not uh, it's woolen spun which gives him the volume and also because of the shorter lengths of the swiss wool fibers it gets more fluffy and uh, lofty gives, gives really lofty uh, wool at the end yes exactly um, to keep the history alive of the yarn we have it on, only available in three natural colors so we combined the white race and the black uh, the brown race together to get this lovely melange color and it's a uh, natural uh, at all so it, we don't use any dye stuffs or uh, high chemicals so basically it's just regular uh, real swiss wool at the end yes and you said that it's quite popular now. It's one of your most popular yarns. Actually, it's a little bit surprising because it's not really a, a soft merino wool. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if it's because of Corona or because uh, people changed their behavior of uh, selling wool. But in the last few years, we had a really big increase of selling this uh, type of wool. Um, and they use it for uh, knitting vests or, or like... Uh, outer garments. Outer garments, exactly. So... Even I, yeah. if it's uh, in the skin, it's a little bit uh, scratchy. And, and like, you knitted something that you wore at the festival. <laughs> well, actually, my wife knitted... Uh, uh, the, a skirt? A skirt. Actually, I was uh, trying to uh, impress people a little bit at the Swiss Yarn Festival in 2020. Yeah. So uh, I thought to um, impress the people a little bit, I was wearing a skirt. Yeah. Uh, with this, with this uh, Swiss yeah. wool and uh, the first time I came out of the elevator I was really sweating all red in the face <laughs> because I didn't know how people gonna react on the on the skirt and the last time we were at the Swiss yarn festival everybody was asking why didn't you wear the skirt we really missed the skirt so it's a little bit uh, funny story about that yes okay and Something, this is similar this is similar exactly we have uh, about the same thickness in the three ply, but uh, we added about 20% of uh, polyamide to reinforce uh, the Swiss wool. So we use it uh, for socks. Uh, when we go a little bit thinner, we have uh, only three ply, but uh, even if it's thinner than uh, the three ply, we still are a lot thicker than the, the four ply regular mm -hmm. uh, wool Sock, that's yeah. used for socks. Exactly. So basically, um, we recommend it to use it in, uh, in ski boots or uh, when you go hiking in the mountains. I think it's the best yarn because it takes out a lot of moisture and uh, it's really, really uh, durable for this type of hobbies. And didn't you say a woman came and she'd uh, knitted a pair 10 years ago that uh, lasted for 10 years? Yes, exactly. That's a, a really funny story because everybody's asking about how durable is it? Is it really a strong yarn? So this uh, particular woman came in uh, back after 10 years uh, in the store and they asked us, right now we are. Uh, she needs new material because after 10 years the sock finally were worn out and the uh, I got some holes already, so it's a, a really funny story. It looks like uh, they're kind of durable. Yes. Yes. They exactly. look lovely for hiking. Yeah. For sure. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But like I said, they mm -hmm. are uh, not that soft uh, or, or nice wool when you have to wear it on the on the skin. So of course we had uh, we have a lot of requests also for soft wool like the merino or or even uh, mixed with silk. So uh, we have therefore. Uh, because we are a woolen spin uh, company, 
we cannot we are not able to do the really uh, thin merino yarns for example as but worsted spun as worsted spun exactly yeah. so we can produce uh, merino wool but then it's woolen spun and it's mm -hmm. not the same quality yeah. uh, as uh, we like to go uh, on uh, for our customer mm -hmm. because that's i think the most important thing when you are uh, doing pretty expensive uh, material uh, within Switzerland. It has to be uh, really high-end quality and yeah. uh, 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 material that, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, so uh, what, goes really high what's end. this one? This is a blend of merino and silk. Exactly. That's a, a good example for the corporation or the, for the uh, different types of possibilities we still have here in Switzerland. Yeah. Because in the past... Uh, uh, textile business was really important for Switzerland, but with the high salaries, uh, most of the companies either they uh, broke down or they went to foreign countries like uh, Bangladesh, uh, where it's much, much cheaper to produce garment. But even there, right now, it gets too expensive. So lots of companies go to Ethiopia, for example, where okay. it's still cheaper yeah. uh, to produce. But well, I think that's a problem we have all over Europe. Mm -hmm. That's not uh, yeah. a Swiss only problem. But still, for us, it's important because we are a, a, an old Swiss company. We would like to work together with other Swiss companies. And there are still some of them left. And uh, we try to work together with them. To, in a partnership. In a partnership, exactly. To to uh, use the best we have uh, in, in within Switzerland. This uh, particular yarn, the Phyllis, is, uh, like you said, a mix um, wool and silk. And it's produced at the Swiss Mountain Silk Mill, the only uh, silk spinning mill we have left in Switzerland. They uh, produce a really, really nice uh, blend. And this one is especially made for us. It's, uh, uh, it's called a cobbler twist. Uh -huh. So basically they do a an, an two-ply in uh, S, S direction, direction yeah. exactly, and then another three-ply in Z direction. So you, at the end the yarn looks like it's knitted. So it gets more, more volume uh, and therefore uh, also because of the two plying processes it's very, very durable and, and uh, a stable yarn. It's really nice that it doesn't peel that much like a uh, yeah. Okay. Other yarns you can uh, That's really interesting. buy. Yeah. Okay, and then you supplies. dye it. Exactly. We buy it on cones, make the, the skeins here ourselves, and then we go in the dye house and uh, you see these little uh, uh, different shades on the yeah. guide. Okay? So we put the, by hand, also it's hand dyed, we put the dye stuff on, on top of it. And because the special machines we have, uh, the dye stuff runs down the skeins and it gives a really a lovely shade. Yeah. Of, uh, of the yeah. different colors. Diff so, and yeah. we've got some more behind us. Exactly. These different. ones and behind, we have different materials where we do the, the hand dyeing. In the past few years, that was uh, uh, really coming up. People really like the different shades, the different possibilities we have. So that's, yeah, it, it's not just plain one color. It's, yeah, it makes it, it really interesting, exactly. Yeah. And this is another from another Swiss meal, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. This one uh, we uh, introduced in the last Swiss Yarn Festival a few days ago. It's uh, very similar to the Phyllis. It's uh, a mix cotton and linen and it's produced in, well, again, the last cotton spinning uh, mill in Switzerland. It's called Spurry 1866. So 1866 is the year that it, it was, was established it, yeah. or founded, exactly. So also a very old company and uh, also with a lot of knowledge because uh, as far as i know they are they have the world record in thin spinning cotton so basically they have uh, spun one yarn with uh, 100 grams for 50000 meters lengths also and is that for high end shirts well i think this world record was just to see okay. how it uh, how fine they can work yeah. but uh, the usual production they're doing right now of course they make really really uh, high end shirts with uh, uh, the most expensive cotton you can find it's it's kind of the vicuña of the wool they're using for for their ah, shirts as well okay, yes okay. that's the the sea island cotton it's almost as expensive as uh, silk at the end and then how do you make it into a knitting yarn um basically we buy uh, a yarn from them mm -hmm. 
which uh, they are using for, uh, for the for the suit for the shirt for the shirts yeah. exactly thank you and uh, we make a 10 ply out of it uh, and with all the process and the twist we have to go uh, to the steaming machine so mm -hmm. we can relax the yarn so it doesn't uh, uh, hike uh, uh, travel around when yeah. you start knitting yeah, yeah. it and you get like the, the an bias, yeah. yes exactly that's uh, really important and um, afterwards we go make the skeins again go in the dye house do the dyeing ourselves and uh, go back on cones and uh, make the 50 gram balls it's a total local Swiss product. Yes. As with this. Very similar to that's, this one. That's exactly. very special. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and this. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. That's just that's uh, yeah. Yeah. That they're three very different yarns, and uh, yeah, very interesting to hear how they're produced and and what you and the different things that you are able to use them for. Because really, there's no bad product, is there? Basically. There's no bad product. You just have to know for what the reason you want to do it or what you want to yes. do out of it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, okay. So we'd like to hear a little bit more about your uh, milling equipment, how old it is, and if there's a particular piece of equipment that might have a particularly interesting story or that somehow has a special meaning to you. Uh, new machines are usually quite expensive and uh, for such a small company, not affordable most of the time. So we stick uh, with what we have. Uh, for example, our carding machine is uh, over 100 years old, but uh, that doesn't have to be uh, a bad thing at all, actually. It's uh, for us quite interesting to work with, with this machine because uh, it is very old. Um, it, it probably uh, doesn't break down that often. It doesn't break down because uh, for 100 years before they, they built it really for eternity. So uh, uh, if you keep an eye on it and uh, if you maintain them well, they hold forever, basically. Uh, well, uh, usually we have in one hand you have the oil can and in the other hand, if it's really necessary, you have the hammer <laughs> just to make sure if, uh, <laughs> if the machine doesn't react properly, you have something else to, uh, well... <laughs> Keep it in line. Keep it in line, exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's that's true, yes. But usually also the machine talks to you. It's like uh, telling you, hey, uh, we have a problem here. It starts whistling or uh, and then you can go and try to solve the problem. You can... Uh, uh, either way, you have to oil a bearing or, or you go and uh, have some wool stuck in a cylinder when you can remove it and then it starts uh, working properly. The bigger problem is if you have really uh, a part that breaks down or yeah. it falls apart, then the problem, of course, the start. So you cannot just call the company and uh, order a spare part anymore uh, because that's a little bit hard. Yeah? Also, you basically you just disassemble the, the machine or the, the part go to a mechanical shop and they have to build it new. And so then you're out of production for a couple of weeks. We are out of production, yes, yeah. uh, a couple okay. of weeks. And you don't have to ask uh, if it's expensive. You just go on and yeah. order it and that's yeah. it. Yes, exactly. And um, you actually have a funny story about the wool picker. So I want you to tell the viewers. Yes, of course. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, no, it, it's really... Uh, kind of funny story uh once when we took over uh, the company for my parents we had uh, a small old picker and uh, i was working there and just wanted to uh, finish work and i just had really a tiny tiny little bit wool left and that just didn't went uh, through the machine so i had a nice idea and i took a screwdriver <laughs> and pressed with the screwdriver pressed the wool uh, in, uh, in the cylinder and of course not only the wool went in the in the picker but the screwdriver as well so basically it went was a big really big noise loud noise and i got scared at all and i was running to the door uh, and after a few seconds i well, came Calm down, down. come down, and I uh, was walking back to the machine, and it stopped already. And uh, I was looking at the damage, and uh, basically the place where I put the screwdriver in, all the the pins of the picker were thrown out of the machine, and uh, the screwdriver basically made a ninety degree angle. And we had about two weeks uh, repairing the machine and make sure that no pins were uh, in the wool that I was uh, preparing for the carding machine. Yeah. So that's, uh, well, at least I didn't uh, put, your put your finger, my yeah. finger inside the machine. That would be horrible. So, yeah. so you've got old machinery, but you've also got some that are related, um, 
uh, organized or run by computers, right? Yes, yeah. yes. I think that's a big difference. The older ones are with the bearings and with the, all the, the mechanical parts. And the, I think the biggest uh, invention there was the computer. So it's just uh, the modern part. So you have to touch a uh, PC, a touch panel where you can make all the adjustments. But the spinning, the, the, the really technique of the spinning process is still the same mm -hmm. from the first machines when you have like the, the flowers on the carding machine that took all the wool mm. apart. So basically, yeah, it's that, the same. that's the, the really big. And, and what about the dye house? In the dye house, uh, we use it, like I said, for, for washing mm -hmm. uh, the the, sp uh, the wool that we spun, but also for the dyeing part. Most of them, uh, um, especially when we have the yarn, we dye the skeins. And uh, there we have uh, two different machines for uh, skein dyeing. Uh, I, I call it just squared arm machines. I don't know exactly how to call it in English because um, usually when you go in the dyeing machine, you have to cover the wool with water. Yes. It's like when you uh, cook the spaghetti, all the spaghetti that are outside of water, that they stay, uh, they stay hard. Yeah. And it's basically the same when you go for uh, dyeing the wool, when you have no uh, covered the wool with water, it stays white. Yeah. And uh, on the this squirt or machine, it's a little bit different. You have the water and the dye stuff on the bottom. Then you have a pump that sucks the water out and pushes it or presses it in this arm and the arm mm -hmm. has a lot of holes mm -hmm. and the water squirts out of these holes and uh, if you have them covered with the material it just runs down the machine so you have a, a really soft uh, procedure and not like a, a lot of pressure like the uh -huh. other machines where you press the water through the wool and uh, with a lot of temperature sometimes you have a problem with felting uh, inside the machine. So we used the squirting our machines really for the uh, soft dyeing soft process, dyeing process yeah. when you have silk, when you have like wool that's for uh, delicate, delicate wool, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. It looks really, looks really nice when you start dyeing it. Well, we're going to have a tour of the, of the mill in just a moment. So <laughs> I'm going to get some footage, which I hope you all have seen of, the, of all of these procedures. So just one last question. A family business is often more of a lifestyle than a job. So what is it like for you to work so closely with your family members and also to be in a family that's done so through multiple generations? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, kind of special. As you can imagine, it's not mm. uh, a job nine to five. So basically, uh, when you have a lot of work, you have a lot of work to do. You cannot just go home and uh, be there. So, of course, there are... Uh, longer working hours as well but uh, for us especially uh, we built our house next to the company some might say that's uh, a bad thing because then you have to work all the time or you go to work all the time but uh, it also gives you uh, an opportunity to see your for example your child's growing up because we are about 10 meters away so if yeah. there was a problem with with the kids I can leave the company for a few minutes or a few hours and, and go there and, and see what happens. So basically I saw my my, my kids growing up and I, I saw the first smile and I saw when they was walking around. So it, that's, I think it, it's, for me, it was really a win-win situation. Yeah. You can go work in the evening when uh, the kids are sleeping, for example. And uh, I think that's also an, an uh, important thing for, for our employees because all of them, they live uh, right here in our small, tiny village. Uh, and if they have a problem with the kids, they can go home. And on the other side, they are uh, uh, willingly to work in the evening if, if uh, it's really necessary, if, really, uh, if we really have uh, yeah. a lot of work to do. Yeah. And um, so that's... I think uh, a special arrangement, a special arrangement yeah. for, for both of us as well, yes. And your mother is also still working, isn't she? And she's been working in the business for the last 50 years. Yes, exactly. Also, it's, it's, uh, she's almost 75 years now, but uh, over the past, like you said, 50 years, she uh, built up a relationship with the customer. We have the, the factory store where actually people are over Switzerland they uh, talk about the factory store and they they uh, tell other customers ah you have to go there and you have to really see it it's really impressive or, or like old and, yeah. and everything and uh, over the past years uh, she really got uh, 
build a relationship with some of the customers. Yeah. And uh, for us, that's uh, a really important thing. Yes, of course. Well, Madeline and I are totally thrilled that we were able to come here in person and, and um, do the interview in person and also see, see the meals. So it's been really fantastic to have you on Fruity Knitting. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Let's say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thanks.